whether you're a skeptic or a believer. Join me, Rob McConnell, as together we'll investigate the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology here on the Exxon Radio TV show on XZBN and the Exxon TV channel on Simul TV. Since 1990, the Exxon Radio TV show has been the place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. Together, we'll investigate UFOs, aliens, ghosts, Bigfoot, psychic phenomena, lake monsters, conspiracy theories, government cover-ups, the truth embargo, alien abductions, ESP, haunted locations from around the world, and so much more. With over 28 years of broadcasting and more than 4,500 individual guests, The X-Zone is truly a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality, as evidenced by the credibility, integrity, and professionalism of the guests that we bring to our international audience. If you have seen a UFO, had a close encounter, seen a ghost, Bigfoot, lake monster, or a story that you would like to share or have investigated, contact me, Rob McConnell, by sending me your email to xzone at xzoneradiotv.com or you can call toll-free 1-800-610-7035, extension 143, and on Skype, Exxon Radio TV. For more information on the Exxon Radio TV show with yours truly, Rob McConnell, visit www.exxoneradiotv.com or www.exxonetvchannel.com or simultv.com and xzbn.net. Until next we meet here in the Exxon from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Always remember Exxon Nation. Keep your eyes to the sky and your heart in the light. The Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. All hit radio. Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. And welcome to another edition of the X Zone. I am Rob McConnell. We're coming to you from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. If you'd like to send me an email, X Zone at X Zone Radio TV dot com on all social media sites, X Zone Radio TV. And to find out about the programming we have available for you 24 7, 365 on the X Zone Broadcast Network, visit www xzbn.net and for our programming schedule on Simul TV on the Simul TV radio network as well as on the Simul TV uh, station where we have our Exxon TV channel visit www.simultv.com my guest this hour Exxon Nation is Todd Clements now 30 years ago when Todd was a child visiting Mackinac Island he saw something that stayed with him all of his life. He could not explain what he saw, but could only label it as a ghost. Now, this one event sparked the curiosity of a young man and with a simple tape recorder and a set of dowsing rods, Todd began seeking out the unknown. He has researched fields including UFOs, cryptids, ghosts, and other unexplained phenomena. However, he has always returned to the place where he had his first sightings 
Mackinac Island, Michigan. Joining me now is Todd Clements, and Todd, welcome to the X Zone. How you doing? Thanks for having me on. I'm doing great. Thanks very much for joining us. Um, tell us about that first experience you had on Mackinac Island, what, some 30 years ago now? Yeah. Well, I, I hate to correct you. It's Mackinac, drop the C. All right. <laughs> we do it all the time. All righty, there we go. It, Mackinac, it, drop the C. Fr- it's the French way of saying it. I see. So, it's an interesting island. It's got Native American, British, French, Amer- United States. It's got, everybody's held it at one point. Right. And everybody's just different. Um, yeah, I was uh, on a summer vacation uh, as a 12 year old uh, kid, mm-hmm. and we were at Mission Point Resort. Family was there. We're swimming. It's hot. It's July. I just got out of the pool, and I grab a towel. I sit down next to my mom. I'm looking at there's there's really high bluffs around the island, and behind the pool there's a bluff, probably about 75 to 75 to 100 feet high, and I'm looking up at it, and there's little drops along the bluff, and then there's sheer bluff faces too, and I see someone standing near some bushes, and it's not at the top, it's not at the bottom, it's kind of in a, a section in between. Mm-hmm. And he's staring down at the pool, and I'm looking closer, realizing that he's not completely solid. He's kind of a transparent person. And I was like, oh, my gosh. And my mom is sitting right next to me. I turn to her. I go, Mom, look, look, what's that? And it was completely gone. Nothing, not a trace of anything ever being there. Now, I w- I'm still... I'm still an adventurous, looking around, always exploring, you know, type of person. I was sure. like that when I was 12, too. And Mackinac Island is a pretty safe place for the most part. You're on an island. It's eight miles circumference. And kids can go wandering. I was 12 years old. Me and my brother went wandering in the woods and tried to find the place that I saw, the guy that was looking down at us or at me from the bluffs. And I found it. And I look to where this man would have been standing and we couldn't easily, we didn't even do it, we couldn't easily climb down to it, and there's no way someone could just literally, in two seconds of turning heads, climbed up it and gotten to disappear. And there was nothing there he could have hid behind, there was nothing at all, plus the fact that I could kind of see through him. And I was like, I just saw a ghost. And it stuck with me. Um, When I was a kid, I was one of those kids on Christmas morning, you get all your toys, you open them up, and then I get the screwdriver, I take them apart, see how they work, and put them back together again. <laughs> so I, I've, always, I've always wanted to see how everything works. Well, ghosts are another thing. How does it work? What happens when we pass on? Why are they, some people ghosts? Why aren't some people ghosts? Right. Where are they? How can I find them? It's pretty much what happened, and, and anything that's unexplained I got interested in based on the fact that I was the kid who was always wondering how things were done. Um, you know, that's where cryptids and UFOs and ghosts and you name it, anything from spontaneous combustion to tele- tele- telepathy and everything. I've always, I've been interested in all of it pretty much all my life. When you so, had your ghost sighting, how far would you say the, the ghost was from you where you were sitting? I would, ooh, that's the first time I've ever asked me that. I would say 150 feet, give or take. Mm-hmm. About 150 feet on the bluff. Hey. Uh, pretty, there's nothing blocking between you and where he was. There was no right. trees. There was nothing. It was, was a straight shot. You could see him standing there looking down. And what was he wearing? Uh, he looked like he was wearing a T-shirt, and he had short hair. Mm-hmm. It was a light color hair, and that's all I could really see of him. I couldn't see legs. They His legs might have been in the grass that was there. But right. There wasn't much grass, and it just wasn't. It was like he wasn't a full person. Did you ever find out who that ghost might be? I actually did, and it was years and years and years later. I I came across someone who'd been at the resort, knew a lot of the history at the resort, and I was actually writing my first book, and I was like, okay, who is this? Mm -hmm. I saw this ghost when I was 12 years old. I don't know who it was. And she goes, oh, Harvey. She knew all about him. A lot of the staff at the resort knew about him, too. And it's a nickname. It's not his real name, but right. we, we use that as his nickname. Um, he was a college student there, and there's some mystery behind how he died. But I did eventually see a photo of him, and I was like, yep, I think that's the guy I saw. I mean, wow. it was a long time ago, but it was similar enough that I'd say that could be the guy. 
Something and, like um, something like that is imprinted in your in your mind. Uh, for oh yeah, you don't forget something like that. Exactly. I mean, the first time you see something, any time I've ever seen anything, and I mean, I've been doing this all my almost my whole life, mm-hmm. and I've only actually seen something five times. That's it. It's not something you get all the time, and I'm fortunate to see those five things I've seen. So, and and what were those five but, things uh, that you saw? Yeah, well, Harvey was the first right. thing I ever saw. And years, a few years later, I saw a shadow person. Uh, that was on one of my makeshift investigations. It was a person, but there was absolutely nothing but black. And it was across the room in a, um, a large, it was a large, it was actually on Mackinac too. Uh, it was a large sound stage area and I could see him moving, walking. And as soon as I put a flashlight towards the person, it's, they moved really quick and then they were gone. Wow. It was kind of like a blur and they were gone, just gone. Um, another one, and I saw on another investigation, same place, a shadow, two shadow figures in the same area. That was with other people on that one. There were witnesses to it, but of course we didn't get it on camera. You never do, right? Yeah. Uh, the other one was Harvey again. That was on, and actually we do a tour on Mackinac Island and one part of the tour at the time uh, goes in the theater at Mission Point Resort, and this tour was going on, and the tour guide that was telling them some of the stories was on the stage, and they were in the seats. I'm in the very far back of the theater, and nobody knew I was in there because it's, the lights are all out. The only light is the light on the stage so mm-hmm. that you can see the tour guide talking. And nobody knew I was in there, and I didn't want to say anything, but I'm sitting there in the back freaking out because right next to me I can see, if I'm looking at the stage, I can see a person standing right next to me. If I turn my head towards them, they vanished. And the more I turn my head back towards the stage, the more they became a solid person again. And they weren't just standing motionless. They were shifting their weight. They moved their arms. I'm freaking out in the back, but I knew if I had said anything, Everybody in those seats, including the tour guide on stage, would have probably had a heart attack <laughs> because they're all on edge hearing a ghost story. And I go, I would be like, turn around, take a picture, please, hurry. And they'd be like, oh. So I didn't ever do anything with that one. Um, and the other one was, the last one I saw was in the woods. I saw something that looked like a person in the woods. Uh, all my things actually have been on Mackinac Island. I've had other experiences, but the actual sightings where I saw something. We're on Mackinac Island, and it could have been a. It looked Native American, like a Native American man with some sort of a headdress on. It was down a path, and he disappeared. But he was. There's nobody in full headdress running around on Mackinac Island, unless it's like a special parade or anything like that. And he was on a path. I was walking down, and I saw him in the distance. And then he took off in the bushes, and I was like, "That doesn't make sense. There's nobody wearing those kinds of clothes on this island." And he was gone. Wow. You and I have to take our first break. Please stand by. Exo Nation, our guest this hour is Todd Clements. And uh, he is uh, the gentleman behind Haunts of Mackinac, www.hauntsofmackinac.com. And um, if you'd like to find out more about Todd, Mackinac Island, and, and such, um, his book, The Haunts of Mackinac, is, is a great resource of the island's history, legends, and ghost stories. We'll be back on the other side of this break as we continue here in the X-Zone from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. My name is Rob McConnell. Todd and I will be back after this short break. Todd Clements is our guest this hour, Explanation. We're talking about the haunts of Mackinac 
And uh, if you'd like to find out more about the Haunts of Mackinac, as well as Ted Clements, his website is www.hauntsofmackinac.com. And it is spelt Haunts of M-A-C-K-I-N-A-C. Dot com. Todd, do people live on Mackinac Island year-round, or is it strictly a, uh, an entertainment and historical site? It's interesting. Um, there's about roughly 500 people who call it home year-round, mm-hmm. and then in the summer, it's about four to 5,000 people who call it home wow. for the summer. Uh, so it's a very big seasonal population that comes and goes. Uh, the 500 that are there in the winter, uh, i been there in the winter i've never spent an entire winter i spent two weeks there in a winter and it it it's real cold i mean snow in feet wind wow. whipping off the, the straits of mackinac basically lake michigan lake huron mm-hmm. drifts 25 feet tall i mean <laughs> it was it's quite an experience um but yeah they have a they have a school it's a k through 12 uh some years they'll graduate one or two kids In a big year, they graduate 12 to 15 kids. They all go to the same building. Uh, They ride their snowmobiles to school, and if they're not old enough, their parents ride them in, like, sleds behind and pull them in (laughs) snowmobiles to school, no buses or anything. It's definitely a different way of living, for sure. Why do you think Mackinac is so haunted? It's Yeah, that's something, uh, because being the person who likes to tear everything apart, I'm like, why? I've always asked myself the same question. And uh, there's a few theories uh, as to why Mackinac Island might be so haunted. Uh, the first is it's a chunk of limestone and quartz, basically sitting in the middle of water with heavy, heavy currents that, uh, I'll give you an example of the currents. Uh, there was two guys who went out on a rowboat to go fishing and they were just going out into the straits between round Island and Mackinac Island and wound up two miles out into Lake Huron, just from the currents pushing them. So it's really strong currents, uh, which drags, obviously, sand, rock across the bottom, and it creates a very small natural electrical charge, but right. still, over time, it can build up. Uh, that's one of the reasons. There's storms up there. We've had winds that will go up against a hurricane, 90-plus 90, 90 mile-an-hour winds whipping through the straits, 25-foot waves. And uh, I have seen the 20 foot waves, and I couldn't believe it. It was a lake when you see those waves that are 20 feet tall. You'd expect something crashing like, over the dock in the harbor. Yeah, you'd expect uh, waves that, of 20 feet tall to be somewhere except an inland lake. Yeah, you'd expect that on an ocean. Yeah, you'd exactly. You'd expect that on an inland lake. And especially when you can see the other side through the straits, you can see the upper, lower peninsula. There's a couple other islands. Mm-hmm. There's never a place you can't see the other side, and these waves are coming through, and they were huge, and the wind, and it, it can get rough. Usually, it's in the fall that you see those kinds of weather, that kind of weather. It's like late October, November that that happens when the seasons are changing and everything's getting whipped up. Uh, lightning hits the island on a regular basis. That's another thing which can get into the rock, the limestone, the quartz, and it charges it up. That's it's just a theory, but. I think it may have something to do with it. Uh, the island has a lot of history. Mm-hmm. The history has a lot to do with it. Native Americans, as far back as we can tell, have had something to do with the island for nearly 8,000 years. They found uh, walrus bones on the island. They found a walrus skull on the island at one point. So it was definitely something was there during the Ice Age. And back those times, they find uh, they just recently had a submarine um, find caverns, some caverns, uh, not too far offshore, but far enough that people aren't going to go snorkeling to it. And they said there were pottery shards in these little scoop caves uh, down below the water off the coast of the island. So it's got a very long history. Uh, The War of 1812, the Revolutionary War, the fort on the island most people don't realize is not an American fort. It's a British fort from the Revolutionary War. Uh, a lot of people think it's an American fort because it was an American fort most of the time, but the British actually built most of the fort. They uh, manned it until there was a treaty that was signed for uh, after the Revolutionary War, and it became the United States. And then in the War of 1812, uh, some of the first cannon fire during the war actually happened on Mackinac, and actually the first cannon shot 
There was no guns, nothing, just one warning shot. And the American side surrendered the fort to the British <laughs> because they couldn't defend the fort. They couldn't defend the town. We just right. said, okay, hands up. We got 60 men here. You guys are on the high ground. You got a cannon pointed down at us. You had a, They had a militia of Native Americans. They had all their British soldiers ready to go. And they never even knew they got there. They came over in the middle of the night. That's where British landing was just spot on the island. That's roughly the area that they docked. Um, all their boats and their ships and everything, and then they hiked through the woods to get to the high point right above the fort, and they took the island, and we didn't get it back till another treaty in 1814. My goodness. So that seems to have been the the way the forts went back then during the War of 1812. Yeah. Rebel- you know, back and forth, back and, back and forth. forth, back and forth. <laughs> you know, kind, yep. of, kind of silly when you look at it these days, but at least we're the best of friends now. The United States and Canada. Yes, we are. Uh, let Absolutely. me ask you. Let, let We're me, buddies. We are. We truly are. Um, let me ask you this, yep. Todd. The fact that there were there was so much Native American influence on that island, uh, I would imagine mm-hmm. that some of the island is considered to be sacred grounds by the Native Americans. Does this have anything to do with the hauntings that go on? It's funny. Yeah. There are some things on that island even I haven't completely understood. Mm-hmm. I'm not a big Native American lore. I know some, uh, but I've talked to people who really know. Uh, yeah, I know that the island was Native American. It was sacred ground. They buried their chiefs, their high medicine men. The people who were important were buried on Mackinac Island because they considered it, some of the tribes considered it kind of their Garden of Eden, where right. man was created and their God lived. Uh, Gichi Manitou was their god, and he came to the island and created the world. And then he left the island. There's stories with all the rock formations, like his wigwam is a rock called Sugarloaf. Um, his doorway is arch rock. There was a staircase cut into the ground at one time, but they blew it up to build the road around the island. Uh, it was called the Giant Staircase and just different things. So there's a lot. There's some Native American burial mounds still on the island, Uh Eventually, though, everybody was burying people on the island because it's kind of got the whole Hollywood thing to it. Well, if the famous people are doing it, why can't I? Yeah, so they started. Shame, yeah. If the the rule of thumb is, if you can dig deep enough to bury someone, there's somebody already there. And we do find bones. You people know find bones when they remodel things or dig a basement. Uh, one of the hotels in the island, Bicycle Street Inn. Uh, it's about four or five years ago, uh, put a ba- they, there was an old house there, and they the old house, they were going to move it. Nobody moved it. Everybody said, no, 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 no. So they said, all right, we're going to get rid of it. They got rid of the house, and when they were pouring the basement and doing the foundation work for the hotel, they found 24 sets of human remains <laughs> underneath that house oh my gosh. and what's now the basement. So, yeah, anywhere you go. I mean, the park in front of the fort, they... they said the soldiers were putting in a like a, a farm they were going to plant crops and things they said they found about a thousand sets of human remains in front of the fort when they were building that putting the farm together wow so yeah unreal <laughs> and there's just a, there's so many stories of that um there was uh there's a, a bed and breakfast called hans on mm-hmm. the island and they remodeled their kitchen i love this story just because it's kind of cute <laughs> But uh, they remodeled the kitchen, took up the floor. Yeah. When they took up the floor, they were putting some pipes in, so they had to dig in a little bit, mm-hmm. and they found bones. They found, and they found out it was, they, she still had some jewelry, her moccasins. There was still some of the leather was still it was preserved, and there was nothing left of her but bones. But they took it all up, put the pipes in, and they said, we really should put this back. They put everything back right where it was. And then they put a brand new floor in, sealed everything. It's done. And then they found a moccasin sitting in a, and somebody had walked walked off with it oh, no. and left it in another room after everything was put down. So the moccasin is still sitting on the fireplace mantle in a glass case. And they named the Native American woman, whoever it was, she wants a shoe. Isn't that cute? She, you know, she wants a shoe. So, <laughs> but that's that's a classy story because the the people who were doing the renovations uh, they showed respect. Oh yeah, yeah, and that's, they try to as best they can, for right? Sure. Uh, you know, and it seems today a number of the paranormal community are very are, are very disrespectful of of spirits. Yeah, I see it sometimes. Yeah, and you know what? I, I no matter 
if the person is alive or dead, I believe they deserve respect. I agree. Yeah. You and I have to take our next break, my friend. XO Nation, we're talking All to right. Ta Todd Clements. He is the author of Haunts of Mackinac, uh, the book that started it all. Haunts of Mackinac is a yep. great resource of the island's history, legends, and ghost stories. The book has been a bestseller in the region for 10 years, and I fully understand why after talking to Todd for nearly <laughs> half an hour now. If you would uh, like to send me an email, exxon at exxonradiotv.com on all social media sites, Exxon Radio TV. And don't forget the X Chronicles newspaper is always available for each and every one of you with our compliments at www.xchroniclesnewspaper.com. Read all over the world, and uh, you can read it online or download it. Or if you'd like to pay for it, go to amazon.com. But why do that when... We're giving it to you for free. I'll be back on the other side of this news break as we continue talking about the haunts of Mackinac here on the Exxon with yours truly, Rob McConnell, and my very special guest, Todd Clements. to you tonight around the world on iHeartRadio, the Mutual Broadcast Network, Talk Star Radio Network, and of course, the Exxon Broadcast Network, and we're so happy to be part of Simul TV. And if you'd like to find out about Simul TV, how you can actually watch the Exxon TV channel, as well as another 130-some-odd specialty channels, get 500 video games, as well as video on demand, you're not going to believe this. You're really not going to believe it. So instead of me trying to convince you, just do yourself a favor. Go to www.simultv.com. Todd Clements is our guest. He is the author of The Haunts of Mackinac. His website is hauntsofmackinac.com. Tell me about the Grand Hotel and some of the stories that are that are within the walls of that. that. Everybody wants to know that. Yeah. They don't like talking about their ghost stories. Why not? Why not? It's um, great for business. I think I, I agree, but uh, I think it has something to do with they just want to portray that image of ultra resort, very very nice, classic, Ew, I see. traditional. Hmm. I understand, and and we respect them for it. I sure. mean, I understand, but sure, they got ghost stories, and well, I talked about a few of them <laughs> every now and then. I'll tell boy. everybody, oh yeah, you gotta watch. That's it. What that? I said that a boy spill the beans. Mm -hmm. Share the yeah. info. Well, uh, my, let's see, one of my personal favorite ghost stories, which I've heard from, I've never had an experience personally, mm -hmm. but I've heard it from too many guests at the hotel to say, yeah, that's not, that's not true because these people don't know each other. It's been years and years I've heard these stories from multiple people, different times. They're right. from different states. They're coming in visiting. And it seems that if you're in a room on the second floor above the dining room, sometimes late at night, usually after midnight, after one in the morning, you'll hear noise below. And it's not just like a rumbling. It's chatter of voices, glasses clinging and clanking, and occasionally you hear big band music playing. And one person actually told me that they went to the front desk, or they called down to the front desk to see if anybody was in the dining room, and they said it was empty. He said, Still heard the noise coming from below, which was the dining room. He actually came downstairs, looked in the dining room, lights were off, and it was completely empty. Wow. Goes back to his room. He can still hear the music coming from the floor. It said it sounded like there was a big party below his room. So, And I've heard the same story from several different people. So I think that's one of the interesting kind of residual haunts right. that goes on at Grand Hotel. And I don't see how they're scared. And that doesn't scare anybody. Um, 
there's a story of uh, a little girl who uh, fell out, accidentally fell out of a window. I can't remember the 50s or 60s. I have so many dates in my head. I can't always remember the exact dates. Uh, they said her name was Rebecca, and she will appear to children in hallways. She's very friendly. She's not menacing. She just kind of wants to play, but she only approaches Aww. kids. And I remember one kid telling me this story. Uh, I was doing a book signing on the island, and his mom brings him up. She's like, will you just tell him what you saw? <laughs> this, kid, this kid's nervous. <laughs> I don't know why, because I'm writing. I wrote a book. I don't know why. It doesn't make anything special. But, um, he, he tells me the story. He's like, yeah, I, I was coming back to the room, and, and, and this little girl was down the hallway near our room. And I was kind of scared to go up to her, and she was smiling, and and she had something in her hand. It looked like a ball, and she tried to roll it towards me, and I saw the ball coming towards me. I went to go get it, and it wasn't. It just kind of disappeared. I look up, and she was gone. So, and I hear stories of little kids coming into contact with her, and she's a friendly spirit. She just kind of wanders around trying to play with the kids that are at the Grand Hotel. You know that that so, brings up that brings up an uh, interesting point. Why do some mm -hmm. spirits? And this, I'm asking you for your opinion here. Why do some yeah, yeah, spirits sure, sure. linger and others go? That is the question everybody wants to know yeah. the answer to. I have my ideas. I think some don't know they died. It's a sudden death, quick, you're gone. Mm -hmm. uh, if you ever seen the movie Sixth Sense, that yeah. kind of a thing, you didn't know you died. Yeah, that was uh, Bruce Willis, was, right? Would have been one of those. She fell out of a window. She was dead in a second, and she didn't know she died. Wow. That's a possibility with her. I, then there's the residual, the one that is kind of like trapped. It's a memory trapped in time or the environment mm -hmm. or the rock or something in the wood. And every now and then it kind of is like an echo of something that happened a long time ago. Uh, then there's ones I think that just don't want to leave. They're scared. They don't want to go where we, wherever it is we go. Mm -hmm. Heaven, hell, depends on belief systems. And they just don't want to. Uh, unfinished business. They're there to do things. We have pretty much all these on the island in various locations, different types. The unfinished business ones where there's an in story of an innkeeper uh, at one of the bed and breakfasts, and she checks on guests. She's always was meticulous through her entire life of making sure everyone who stayed with her in her bed and breakfast had the best day you could ever have. She made sure they had the fresh sheets, fresh towels. Is there anything you need? And she always would check on people. And there's a few stories from the Ben Breakfast that she'll check on someone and then walk through the closed door. <laughs> they couldn't tell she was she wasn't there. She looks. They said she looked like a real person and then would walk right through the door. I also wonder, I also understand that there's a story about 13 children who died of typhoid fever. Yep, uh, that would be the Mission House. Mm -hmm. That is the technically that is the oldest hotel on Mackinac Island. Uh, it was built as a mission by Robert, Fer uh, not Robert Ferry. Yeah, it was Robert Ferry. I believe it was Robert Ferry. Ferry, Reverend Ferry. That's what we knew him as. Uh, it was built in, I believe it was 1827. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was built as a school, as a mission for children who were half, half Native American, half French, half British, half whatever, mixed, Matisse, um, children so that they could be civilized in society instead of being savages like the Native Americans at the time. It was a different time. People believe things sure. different ways than they do today. But yeah. uh, so parents would send their kids there so that their kids could function in proper society, quote unquote. And when they were there, the medical treatment at the time wasn't quite what it is today. And uh, a bunch of illnesses did break out. Uh, they would treat fevers by putting kids in the basement where it was cold, yeah. they thought the cold would help break their fever, and it's a cold, dark, cobblestone, dirt-bottomed basement, mildly musty. I've been down there. It's not a place you want to be, especially if you're sick. Right. Uh, and some of the kids passed away in the basement. Uh, accidents happened occasionally. Uh, I know there's a story of one kid who had a rock fall off of one of the bluffs, hit him and killed him. Um, there's various different reasons, but disease was one of the, and sicknesses were the biggest problem. At Mission House, and not long after Reverend Ferry closed the house, and part of it had to do with a lot of kids were dying, obviously. It only lasted a few years. It became a hotel. It ran as a hotel for over 100 years and closed in the 1930s. <laughs> so it gives you an idea. 
that was a hotel for a hundred years, almost a hundred years ago. So it's a very old building. And now it's used by the state park to house their uh, staff during the summer season. In your opinion, where is the most dangerous place on the island? Next to a bluff. <laughs> I guess. Standing at the top of a bluff. <laughs> if you want to talk about actual physical danger, yeah. ride a horse on a trail next to the edge of a bluff. I've done it. I won't do it again. It was just, nope, mm-mm. That horse made one wrong step or got spooked, you're going down 90 feet. So that's my definition of danger. <laughs> it's just falling off of a bluff <laughs> for sure. What's the, what's the drowning pool? The drowning pool, it, it's a legend. It got built into something bigger than it actually is. Mm -hmm. And it's all over the place. Not our story. It's a story from a couple of the locals on the island who I think were having some fun with people. And we did our research after... Go ahead. No, no, I'm listening. Oh, okay. Um, we did some research after we heard about it. We told a few people about it. We put it on our walking tour for uh, about a, two years, just because it was a very interesting story. The story is, and this is a legend, and it's not true. We found out through our fact-checking it is not true. It took some time, but we found out was there was a Salem witch trial type event on Mackinac Island. The story was that there was, and there was brothels on the island, especially when the fur trade and the fort were fully active. It was mostly men on the island and brothels popped up. There's record of roughly seven brothels at the peak. Sounds like Nevada. And there was a, oh yeah, it was like the Wild West yeah. without gunslingers during the fur trade. There's a lot of amazing stories with that. Um, but somehow... Some men were caught by their wives who were on the island in one of the brothels. And they claimed the women in the brothel were witches, and they bewitched them to come to the brothel and, and the house of ill repute, which makes it a good story. Yeah. And then they took the women and said, well, if they're really witches, we have to figure out, oh, well, in Salem they did this. Let's try that. Let's go to the the pool of water that sits near the edge. There's like it Right now the water's too hot. But when the water is lower, <clears throat> it's a pool of water, and the, the lake has come over it. Now it's just part of the lake right now. But when the water's a little bit lower, there's a pool of water. It's roughly 15 to 20 feet deep in the middle. And they said that they tied rocks around their ankles and threw them in. And if they floated, they were witches. We'll burn them. And if they sank, we're sorry. You're innocent. <laughs> sort of like the Salem story. And the story goes that seven, the ghosts of the seven women who were executed at the drowning pool come out and seek revenge on those who get too close to the edge of the water. Todd, stand it, by, my friend. You and I have to take story. our final break. Exonation. Todd Clement is my guest. Okay. www.hauntsofmackinac.com. And uh, Todd and I will be back as we wrap up this hour here in the Exxon from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away. Ted Clements is my special guest this hour, Exxon Nation. He is the author of Haunts of Mackinac. His website is www.hauntsofmackinac.com. First of all, Todd, thank you so much for coming on the show. It has been a delight speaking hey, to you. You're welcome. And um, before we go on, uh, could you finish the story about the, the drowning pool? Yep. Uh, well, long story short, it's a legend. And we did the research and found out that there was one person executed for prostitution during French rule in St. Ignace. And the story is she was probably taken into the lake and drowned. I guess during French rule, prostitution was mm -hmm. punishable by death at one point. Um, That's we rather, also found yeah. that, 
yeah, it's pretty brutal. Yeah, but especially for the one, French. I was going to say one person uh, did actually drown in the drowning pool for real. Oh, really? They did fall in. They got tangled up in seaweed at the, in the deep section, and mm-hmm. they did actually drown. Now, the paranormal activity in there, there's a little bit. You see some strange splashes. You hear footsteps on the gravel rocks around it occasionally. Uh, could it be the person who drowned in there? Maybe, but we don't know for sure. Tell so me, that's the true story of the drowning pool. <laughs> excellent. Tell me about the walking tours that you do. Oh, yeah. Um, we started the walking tour uh, about two years after the first book came out. Uh, it was basically I did book signings and, all the time on the island because the bookstore just they asked me to be there to do book signings all the time because it did well. And I said, to some of the people who are, who are getting books, I was like, how'd you like to go? What are you doing tonight? You want to walk around? I'll tell you more ghost stories. I got tons that aren't even in the books. And they were like, oh, yeah, sure. So one night I decided to have a sign-up sheet. Had 70 people sign up to wow. go. 70 people showed up. I took them. I was a nervous wreck. I was had never done public speaking on a, that type of a basis before uh, that, that night. And I was nervous, but I knew the story. So I just started telling them ghost stories and history and everything. It took three hours, (laughs) and they all stuck with me except for two people, a person in a wheelchair and a person pushing them. Those are the only people who said, we're tired, you're doing a good job, but we're done. (laughs) And uh, at the end, someone had kind of came up to me, everybody kind of walked away, and he said, you know, you're an idiot, you should be charging to do this, and you should be doing this every night. And I'd been on ghost tours in other cities and everything, and I was like, you know what, I never really put two and two together, but you're right. I could do this. I could do this and have a tour, and we could have a business. And yes. have It's good with tourism. Yeah. And uh, we found a spot. We started doing the tours. Uh, I don't give tours as much. I'm not as theatrical. So I hire, actually, tour guides who have theater backgrounds mm-hmm. um, as much as we can because they can give a story better than I can, and they learn their scripts, their lines, and they tell you everything they know. Some of them have been on the island. Uh, one of our tour guides grew up on the island. Not Not right now. This is last season. They went to college. But um, we just kind of tell you all the story. We tell you some of the stories. We always tell everybody it's an hour and a half tour, and we could make it eight to ten hours if we wanted to tell you a whole lot. And we just kind of take them through downtown, stop at some of the spots. We don't cover everything. We change it all the time. Uh, if you've gone on a tour every other year, we change the tour pretty much half the tour is new every other year as as a as someone who has an interest in psychology how do you explain the 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 draw of the paranormal in today's society i think it's just people want answers to things they don't understand it's kind of like i was when i was a kid yeah i wanted to know how it worked and I mean, there's, I think some people are scared of more t- their own mortality. What happens? Is this it? They want to know, is there more than this? And I think that draws some people. They've lost loved ones. You find, I find a lot of people who have lost loved ones get interested in the paranormal because they want to know that they're okay. Yeah. That person they loved is still okay. Um, it's just kind of, and it's fascinating. I mean, not just the whole ghost story thing. I mean, the fact that there could be visitors from other worlds with UFOs or animals that live on earth that are rarely seen uh people say bigfoot no no way and i'm just like you know the the gorilla wasn't known as an actual animal until the 1920s it was bigfoot yeah (laughs) and people are like serious i was like yeah people didn't believe it existed until the 1920s i mean it's 100 years ago so it can happen and they find new species all the time so I, I understand that you've actually done research in the field of ufology, and what ha, what have you found, or what did you investigate? Um, I pretty much I'm not a, I wouldn't consider myself an expert in ufology. Yeah. Uh, I've seen one when I was a kid, mm-hmm. and of course that freaked me out. My mom actually destroyed the transmission on her car when it happened. Oh my! Uh, gosh. It was in Detroit. It was in Detroit, and it was reported. Um, I think across several states, it was on the news. It was a large, it looked kind of like a cloud, sort of like the state shape of the state of Michigan, kind of a mitten shape to it going against the wind. And it was reported in several states. We saw it 
and it was just it you could tell it wasn't a cloud but it looked like a cloud and i remember we were going to grab some dinner and it was i don't remember what month it was but it was dark out it was it was just gotten dark and my mom threw the car into reverse from straight from drive while we were still moving Ooh. to get us back to our house <laughs> and her transmission got just wrecked from doing it i remember that That'll do it. That we'd hear the transmission clunking on the way trying to get back home. I'd just like to go back to your walking tours for a second, uh, Todd. Yeah. Uh, do people come up to you after the tour and tell you about experiences that they've had while on the tour? Yes, we do. We never guarantee it right. on the tour, but we do tell them things have happened on this tour, and some of the things that have happened on this tour are now a part of the tour. We'll talk about it, where it happened. Um, there is a house on the island called the Biddle House on Market Street. It, we go by it. We tell the story of one of the Biddle daughters who passed away. A, they, some say it was um, uh, tuberculosis. Others say it was a broken heart. It's kind of a sad story. But the ghost story is actually at the cemetery, but we tell the story at, when we're standing in front of the house because the cemetery is too far from town to right. walk people to it. During the tour, several times in the past three years, people see a little girl peeking out of one of the upstairs windows. This has been happening on a almost not regular basis, but too much for it to be coincidence. And we think it might be uh, Sophia Biddle's younger sister, Mary, who uh, fell through thin ice and she developed a pneumonia and died in the house. And some people think that she might be who's haunting the middle house. And that's one that we always point out to people on the tour. We're like, keep your eyes on these windows. You might see a little girl, a ghostly little girl in those windows. If you, and they take tons of pictures. We've got some good ones, but of course we never get them. They never send them to us. They just tell us, Oh, we've got one. <laughs> that seems to be the way it goes. Would, uh, would, uh, would you say that, uh, the, uh, what, what would be the demographics of, of the people who take your tour? Is it mostly men, mostly women? Is it a mixture, a mixture it, of all ages? Or is... We find it's mostly women mm -hmm. between, because, uh, of course, the business side of it, I want to know who my customers sure. are for the tour. Uh, it's mostly women, probably about 70 to 75% women. And they're usually between the ages of 30 and 60. That is our peak. Yeah. Our, those are the people who love to go on the ghost tours. Most men are more skeptical yep. about a lot of it. And they come on the tours. Okay, they, they want to hear the history. They don't care about the ghost stories or anything else. They just want to hear about the, the history on the island. And we do the history, but we do some of the darker history, which kind of makes it a little more interesting. Now, your ghost tours, uh, what is your schedule during the summertime from now until yep. when you close? Uh, we close just before Halloween. Mm -hmm. we, we run the schedule pretty close to what the hotel schedules are running. Makes sense, yeah. Uh, some of the hotels, yeah, uh, some of the hotels open a little bit earlier than we do. It just depends. Uh, but we do typically open sometime in early May and close sometime in later October. Uh, we run the tours pretty much every single night except the 4th of July. Uh, we can't compete with fireworks. <laughs> They're too loud for our tour guides to, to talk over, so we don't even bother on 4th of July. Todd, I've got about a minute left before you and I have to say so sure. long. So what would you say to the Exxon Nation tonight when it comes to the reality of the paranormal? There's more... Uh, I think this is actually a quote. There's more in heaven and earth than we'll ever know. <laughs> and there's something, there's something out there that mm -hmm. most of us don't yet fully understand. And people should take it seriously because it's there. Well said, my friend. Todd, again, I want to thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's been a great pleasure talking to you. Maybe we'll bring our TV crew out there and do a session, an episode on, uh, sure. on your tours. So until then, take care of yourself. It's a fun place. <laughs> don't be a stranger. Come back and visit us again, Todd. Sure, absolutely. All right, Exonation. Todd Clements has been my guest at this hour. His website is hauntsofmackinac.com. And once again, don't make that mistake I made by calling it Mackinac. It's <laughs> Mackinac, Haunts of Mackinac. And that is spelled H A U N T S O F M A C K I N A C.com. 
I'll be back on the other side of this commercial break with the news as we continue here in the X-Zone from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't forget, you can always uh, send me an email, X-Zone at xzoneradiotv.com on all social media sites, the X-Zone, let's see, X-Zone Radio TV. And for all the programming that we have on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, xzbn.net, and for Simultv, S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Don't go away. Music. 